you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. <laughs> Acts chapter 17. Thank you so much, Mike and the worship team. It's uh, always a good reminder why we have church. It's about the Lord and it's the worship of the Lord. He is the subject of our songs. He's the subject of our praise and worship. I want to thank you also for your prayers for uh, my family and me and for the two weddings we had in the span of five weeks. Uh, Jerry Blackwood and Bonnie uh, Luce told me years ago that when our kids got married, it's like getting a, uh, a big race. So, still don't feel it, but uh, maybe one of these days we'll see if that's true. And I'll... I'll Tell you guys if that is true. But thank you all so much for your prayers uh, for our children. We're going to be reading in chapter 17. I'm sorry, chapter, yeah, chapter 17, beginning of verse 16. And keep in mind that the words uh, of God that He's preserved for us, this is His very word that we're reading. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for how you preserved your word for us over the centuries. Thank you, Father, for allowing us, Lord, to be able to have it in, in our language that we can understand it. And God, would you open your word to us this morning and to let your Holy Spirit teach us. And Father, would you convict the hearts of people who do not know you through the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that simply oozes out of the very life of the Apostle Paul and the other apostles in the book of Acts. And for us, Father, who know you as our God, as our Savior, because of your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray, Father, that you will also convict our hearts, God, of what the reason you've left us here, and the reason you've created us, and the reason you've redeemed us. Thank you, Father, for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Many years ago, when I used to go to a Sunday school conference in Glorieta, New Mexico, I love to go up there because it's normally in the summer, normally in July. And uh, either June or July. And it's normally hot here, so it was great to get away. But I used to go to a Sunday school uh, conference just to learn more about Christian education and how to encourage people in the Word. And I remember that one time when normally at the start of the mornings they would gather all the pastors and the ministers of education in one setting one large room and they would normally give us some briefing or some there was be some guys speaking to us and that one morning one particular summer that one particular morning this guy came and I'm I don't know I I like to do things if, if there's a way to do something and if I if I can see where the heart of something is I want to be about that and so this guy comes and he introduces the whole thing with, it's almost like looking back, I, I realized it was a sales technique, it was a marketing speech. But he said, this morning I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you the one thing that you cannot do without in reaching people for Christ. He said, it is the one thing that you must have for you to be able to reach Christ wherever you are, whatever time. And it is the one thing that you must have in Sunday school and in your church so you can share the gospel with people and you can be able to reach Christ and to increase the baptisms in your church and increase memberships and increase the number of people in your Sunday school classes and to grow your church. And I remember giving this speech and I was, we were all on the edge of our seats thinking, man, he's discovered part of the Dead Sea Scrolls that we have not seen yet, and He's giving us, He's about to give us something that is so incredibly effective that we will all of a sudden go, wow! And so in anticipation as He paused, He pulls out this little card out of His pocket, and He said, you cannot reach people without a Sunday school enrollment card. I mean, you could feel that room just kind of deflate, you know, oh, you have to enroll people anywhere, anytime, any place. How many of you even remember those campaigns you used to have that we would, good, I'm glad you don't remember that. <laughs> any 
who remembers it. And somehow in the church we have, I don't know, I've grown up in church and when I became a believer, Kim and I were going to uh, church uh, up in the Panhandle and I hung out. We were in business and so but I loved to hang out with the staff members. And I went to all those conferences about the growth spiral. How many of you remember the growth spiral? Andrew remembers all this stuff. You and I had been, had been hanging out with the same people. And we had all these techniques, we had all these ways of, of doing church. And over the years, one thing you've discovered and you will find is that we had forgotten what is at the heart of who we are as believers. And we get so enamored with these forms and formulas and methods and methodologies and techniques of marketing that we had forgotten what is at the very heart of who we are, are as believers. And I want you to see this morning something about the Apostle Paul. In fact, we're going to be looking at two things in this text as we read it. And then we'll go back to it and just explain it a little bit. One is the gospel message. You will find wherever Paul was, whatever he was doing, he wasn't signing people up for Sunday school, but the gospel message was his constant, consistent message that he gave to people. Second is we will discover about the gospel man, what Paul was made of. So let's begin reading. Well, they were in Berea in uh, chapter 17. They had gone back. This is the second missionary journey. They wanted Paul wanted to see how the believers were in those areas include, uh, that they had been to before where they had shared the gospel, including the areas where, they, where he had been stoned, and so they went back. Verse 16 says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, talking about uh, Silas and Timothy, they left him, left him up there, and some people took him down to, uh, to Athens. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, it says that he was greatly distressed. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. The word for distressed there is the same word that you can translate as inferior. In, I can't even say the word. He was extremely upset about it. Inferior, right? Thank you. You all know what I mean. Those of you who don't know me, English is my second language. That's always my excuse. So he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Now, I want you to see something here about Paul, and we'll go back to this later on also, but I want you to see that he was not distressed with the people of Athens, but he was distressed by what he saw that all throughout the Old Testament that you find God was distressed about. God was distressed when His people worshipped idols. And yes, God got mad at people, but these people were in Athens who were not Christians. So he was distressed with that, with the fact that that city was full of idols. So, what does he do? Well, let's, do you have that? I lost mine. Uh, here it is. Here's the map. Paul had been in, in this area here, in, in, uh, in, in Berea. And here's Athens. This is about, this is about 200 miles. And he traveled that on the second missionary journey. He left uh, Timothy and Silas up here. And he goes down to Athens. He goes to Athens and sees that the city was full of idols. Now, Athens was the intellectual center of the world. It was the capital of the ancient Attica, and it was a region, it, it was the part of the Roman region called uh, Achaia. It was, this was the Athens of Socrates, of Plato, of Aristotle, of Epicurus and Zeno. It was also the Athens of Pericles. I don't know if you remember who he was. He was recognized by his contemporary historians, the contemporary historians, as the first citizen of Athens. It was, if you had, if there was a place in the world that was a center of intellectual thought, of, of the, the new thought, of if, and it's kind of like the Oxford of, of the 19th century. If you want to see some people who were really intellectuals, you, you went to Athens. Pericles, Pericles promoted the arts and the literature. It, is, uh, it was through his efforts that, that education was advanced and uh, the, the, the Athens became the center of the ancient Greek world. Uh, and it was him who started this very ambitious project of preserving what they had as a culture, so, so much so that even after the Romans conquered Athens 
and the Greek world. The Romans conquered Greece militarily, but the Greeks conquered the Romans culturally. And that's why even today we would speak of Greco-Roman literature, Greco-Roman architecture, or, or the arts, because the Romans love the Greco, uh, the, the, the Greek mind, the, the kind of, of culture that they had, and they appreciated that. And this was the Athens that greeted the Apostle Paul. And he saw, Paul, when, went, when he went there, he saw that they were full of idols. Someone had said that it was easier to, to meet an idol, one of their gods or goddesses in Athens at the time of Paul, than it was to meet a man, because the population of Athens at the time was about 10,000 people. And yet they said, they estimated over 30,000 uh, statues of gods and goddesses on top of the statues of, of the ancient Greek minds that they had, like Plato and Socrates. So, when, when Paul was distressed, because he saw so many idols there, what did he do? Verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. Now the word for reason here is not like he was using using logic to arrive at a certain conclusion with them. The word reason is where we get the English word dialogue. So he would, first thing he did, which was his very common practice, is he went to the synagogue. Why the synagogue? Because there were the Jewish people believing there. There were the Jews who, who already had a background of, of who God was and the promised Messiah. So he would speak to them. He would dialogue with them. But not only that, look at what he says. He not only went to the synagogue where the Jews were and the God-fearing Greeks were, but also, he dialogued with those in the marketplace of what we call, what they call the Agora. The Agora was the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. They matter who they were, the Greeks loved to talk, loved to just discuss. And so Paul would just go over there, and whoever he saw, he would discuss, he would dialogue with them about the Gospel. Well, part of the group of people who were there, now keep in mind, they had all these statues of these gods and goddesses around Athens. And he was really frustrated with them. With those idols, because he knew his heart was so great that there was only one true God. And yet these people did not know that. And so he, he wanted to tell them about the God because his heart was so great with the reality of who Christ was. And he wanted he didn't want people to miss that. And so he went first to the synagogue, explaining to them, dialogue with them, then he went to the marketplace. Not like he went to Walmart, or he went to H-E-B, or he went to wherever the, there's a soccer game, or there's a football game. And he would discuss with this, this, this idea that Christ is the promised Messiah with people. But in the midst of all these people in the marketplace, it says, look at verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Now, who were the Epicureans and the, uh, uh, the Stoics? The Epicureans were followers of Epicurus, and they were like secular agnostics. They didn't really believe in God. Their view was, in short, was of life was nothing, listen to this, nothing to fear in God, nothing to feel in death. Good, which is pleasure, can be attained. Evil, which is pain, can be endured. That's how basically they summarize their beliefs. The Stoics were followers of the teachings of Zeno, and they were called Stoics because they met on a place called the Royal Stoa, which is on the northwest corner of the marketplace of the Agora. The Stoics were pantheists. They believed that God was in everything and that whatever happened to them was destiny. They were fatalistic. They stressed obedience and self-sufficiency. They valued reason instead of pleasure. And the larger community, what they call, what they call the cosmopolis, and it was very important to them. And these were the people, these were the two most prominent competing philosophies at the time. And so what did they do? Well, some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? It's interesting, it's a, it's a put down, the word babbler is a put down. It, it, it literally means, it, it literally means a seed picker. It's, it's the picture of a bird, like if you throw like rain on the, on, on the ground. You know how birds would just kind of their heads would just go like this? And it's the idea of a seed picker. And, and the idea, it's, it's a put down for people who would kind of like choose a little here of this philosophy, a little of this philosophy, and read a little bit of everything. And then they put it all together and they don't make any sense. And some of the translations would even call it, would even say ignorant babblers because they're not making any 
makes sense. And so that's what they were calling Paul. And the things that he was saying, because to them it didn't make any sense what he was saying because he's speaking. Listen to what he was speaking about. Others remark, it's, he seems to be advocating foreign gods or, or foreign deities or strange deities. They said this because Paul was preaching the goodness about Jesus and the resurrection. See, the Greeks did not believe in the resurrection. In fact, one of their, one of their philosophers said this. Now, when the blood is spilled and the, and, and the soil and the dirt had absorbed the blood, and that's it. There's nothing more to life. And so, Paul was there talking about Christ. Talking about this God who became man and, and who died for their sins and who died for our sins. And then he was buried and he was raised again. Well, they're saying, you're a babbler. You don't know what you're talking about. Strange ideas. Strange talking about some strange deeds. Verse 19, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. Well, you have a picture of Mars Hill. Oh, there is Mars Hill. I know Andrew and Connie have been there. Uh, never been there. I just kind of look at them and read the, 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 the descriptions. But Marcel, it's, it's, it's Areopagus, Areopagus is actually a council. It's a council of Arabs. He was the leading council that dealt with judicial, civil, uh, legislative issues. But also they dealt with philosophical thought. If someone is bringing, if there's some new ideas or someone is teaching some new things, then they will be brought before this council. And this council was composed of the leading men normally very intelligent people who then would decide on, on what it is that you're talking about uh, on top of this. And so Paul was not under arrest, but he was brought before this. Now, it's, I was trying to think, I was trying to imagine what would this be like? I know in our culture today, uh, in, in evangelicalism, we have this idea that somehow when we are faced, for instance, with Issues relating to, or for instance, in the schools. A lot of you are going back to school. Some of you are being homeschooled. But in the public schools, you will be faced with ideas, for instance, about about evolution. And somehow we think that the way to deal with that, when you've got all these months and you've got your textbook saying that this is this is pretty much proven to them, even though we still call it the theory of evolution. And somehow we think that we can engage them tit for tat or wit for wit in, in the level where they are. And, 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 and Paul was faced with the same thing with his, his philosophers, basically. The leading man of Athens. And there was this guy they called, they were calling a babbler. A seed picker. A, a, a mental, intellectual seed picker. And they take him before, before the this council of Aris to kind of discuss what it was that he was discussing, what he was talking about. And by the way, not only there were images of these gods and goddesses in that area, and then to the, to the right of, of, I don't know which picture this is, but, but from this area, you can also see what, what they call the Acropolis. Acropolis means the city on the edge, kind of like the city of Akron in Ohio. The word Akron is from the same word, where we get the word Acropolis. Polis means city. So it's a city on the edge. It was used away for defensive purposes. But one of the most prominent buildings in, in the Acropolis was the Parthenon. So there was this great, almost, almost uh, 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 dominating presence of philosophy and history that is in front of Paul. And you think, what would Paul be doing? What would you be doing if you were in Paul's shoes or sandals? Would you now bring up all your Jewish background training in, in, in theology, in natural theology, and in... In, in logic and be able to say, I'll match them wit for wit in what they're saying. I'll show them that Christians can, can match their, their intellect uh, wit for wit and we will be able to, and I'll destroy all their arguments. Let's see what Paul does. They tell him, you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. And I love how Luke writes this parenthetically. He said, all the Athenians and foreigners who live there spend their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. But when I read that part, I thought, I wonder how they made a living. 
So Paul, what does Paul do? Well, let's look at his speech. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, he addresses these guys, these distinguished men of letters and men of intellect and philosophers, and all the people surrounding the area who were listening to this, to this gathering. He says, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And He is not served by human hands as if He needed anything. Because He Himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man He made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And He determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that man would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the, that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising Him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, We want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed among them was Genosius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. By the way, some of them who said, Hey, we want to hear you again. Look at chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. He never went back. He never went back. But, but let's look at the message quickly that Paul gave. Let's see if he matched the Athenian philosophers with or with. Or there was something that was constraining his heart. There was something that just gripped his heart and could not help but simply proclaim it. I want you to understand something about his message here. When I was reading this, and the more I thought about it, the more I meditated on this text. I, I was trying to compare it with his message to the church in, it wasn't a, 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 a speech like he gave here, but it was a letter to the church in Rome in chapter 1. And I was looking at the tenor of those two, this speech and the tenor in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, it's a little tough. It was a little tough to, you see it, you're going, wow. Chapter 1, verse 18 begins with says, the wrath of God. The, the, the wrath of God. The, God is not ticked off with our sinfulness, but the wrath of God is being poured out for all mankind because for all mankind, because that which is obvious about God, His power and His glory, man has been trying to suppress it and deny it. It says, therefore, man's heart has become darkened and his mind became useless. And he was just Laying it out for them. And of course, chapters 1, chapter 2. Chapter 2 said, those of you who think you've made it. He said, you are judged by the same judgment. And you are just as guilty. Chapter 3 of Romans, he says, all of us are guilty. Everyone has sinned. There is no one who is righteous before God. But here, look at what he says. He begins with, kind of like getting on their level. And he said, men of Athens... I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, he said, yeah, I found this altar with this inscription to an unknown God. The phrase for, or the word for unknown is where we get the word agnostic. 
And so she's not even known this guy. Listen, and then I love what he said. He said, let me tell you about this unknown God. And then he proceeds to tell them, beginning with, with, with verse 24. He presents God as the creator God. He is the creator God. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. And not only that, because He's the creator God, He is the Lord, meaning He has sovereignty over heaven and earth. The phrase heaven and earth doesn't mean that there are other places outside of heaven and earth that is not under His authority. It simply means it, it's, it's a very simple, it's a figure of speech that simply says that He is Lord of everything. There is nothing in this world that is not under His Lordship. And only that, he says in verse 25, that he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. That he is the life giver. Now think about this. These philosophers who were gathered around him, they were worshiping these gods and goddesses who thought that they had a god and a god or a goddess for everything. I was looking at some of the pictures and the descriptions of some of those gods and goddesses. And, and there's so many of them, over 30,000 of them. But some of the most leading ones and some of them are, I thought, that's not even fit for Sunday morning. Like the goddess of afterlife. But they had everything. They had a God for everything. And Paul was explaining to them that there's only one God. He is the creator God. He is the sovereign God who is Lord of everything. And He is also the one who gives life to everyone. He is the giver of life. And then verses 26 and 27, it says, From one man, talking about Adam, he made every nation of men. And he was going back to his history, to his biblical history. He's, I can imagine, I can just see Paul thinking of through Genesis. Genesis 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10 and 11, the nations. 10 is the, the, the dispersion of the nations. This is from one man he made every nation of man, the nation inhabit the whole earth. And he determined, look at what he says here, the sovereignty of God in what he was doing. He determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. One of the questions I've been asked over the years is what about people who have never heard the gospel? Guess what? All of the nations in the world came from one family. According to Genesis 6 through 9, 6 through 10, every nation and every culture that they have studied, even secular anthropologists, they describe a universal flood or a, a local flood, but they describe the flood. And they also had a concept of a child offering given or as a peace offering to, to their God or their gods in, of their culture. Where do you think those things came from? When you look at creation, can you look at creation? Natural revelation and say there is no God. Of course not. So he says he set the times, he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. By the way, if you've ever wondered why God put you in the family where you, where you are, maybe you don't like your parents, or you don't like your brother or sister, you don't like your, some of your family members, or you don't like the place where you were born, guess who set those times and those places for you? Your parents. They're not an accident. Your children, they're not an accident. Where you were born, that was not an accident. I was born in Manila, in the Philippines. That was not an accident. Because God had said it so that in every place, as He said here, wherever we are, God, first of said, God did this so that man would seek Him. What does that word, what does that phrase, what does that mean? That God was manifesting Himself in His sovereignty. He's allowing people wherever they are to see who He was. Because God has always had the desire to have a relationship with people. And he would, He's been doing this all through the history of mankind. He would bring about circumstances in our lives, events in our lives, so that then we will see Him for who He is. And that is why denial of who God is and denial of Jesus Christ is unforgivable. And then he not only presents that, but he says also that, look at verses 28 and 29. He tells them that man, that God has given man intrinsic dignity in the way he's made it. He said, for in him we live and move and have our being. Guess where we have our where we live and move and have our being. In Him. In God. Every person that was created by God. Everything. Every person that has been born in this, in this world. Has 
some of that image of God still in us. Now we would say, we would say, well, how, how can that be? And I understand the concept of the image of God. Check out Genesis 1:26. Let us create man in our image, in our own likeness, and let us make it. And then man destroyed it in Genesis chapter 3. And then, of course, Christ is the second Adam. And says, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 says that in him, that in Christ, uh, uh, that he is the, the image of the invisible God. For by him all things were created. And, and we understand that. And we also understand the, the goal that there is in our life for, for by God for our lives. Gen, uh, Genesis but Romans chapter 8. For those whom he foreknew, he also, be, he also predestined to be what? Someone tell me. To be conformed to the likeness or to the image of His Son. So what was lost in Genesis 3 is going to be recaptured through Christ. I understand it, but think about this. Even lost people, when you say someone is, has, is very talented, you say, that guy, that guy is very creative. Well, guess where that concept of creativity comes from? It is the very image of God because He is the Creator of God. So there's a part of that. So He says... We have our dignity, for in Him we live and move and have our being. And what He's appealing to them about, He said, He said, look at verse 29. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by God's society. It's good. It's, guys, you've been created by this God, this only true God, and He's the one true God. And you think you can reduce Him to put Him in a in a temple built by human hands and the image of Him? Made by human hands and made of silver or gold or stone? Of course not. You, you are not created in that way. You have more dignity than that. And, and that is why he says, he challenges them to repent. He says, look at verses 30 and 31. He says, in the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. What does the word repent mean? It means you're going this way, you're worshiping the idols, and you turn the other way, and you worship the only living God. He's the only God. Through Christ, and that's the only way that you can repent. For he has set a time, a day, when he will judge the world. They think they can just figure things out. They didn't think there was no tomorrow. They thought when you died, that was annihilation, and that was it. But he says in verse 31, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Speaking about Christ. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. What was the message of Paul? It's a simple gospel message. He didn't match them wit for wit in their intellectual capacities. Let me just give you some. We already looked at the responses, but let me just give you a couple of observations about the gospel message. The message that Paul delivered was simply the gospel message, and I've said this before. Guys, there is, there, there is no gospel for intellectuals and there's no gospel for, for dummies. There is no different gospel for secretaries and one for lawyers and one for doctors. There's not a different gospel for anything. In fact, there's only one gospel because the problem with men is not pornography, it's not adultery, it's not homosexuality, it is not theft, it is not any of those things, but it's simply sin. It's rebellion shaking our fist at God. And so the answer to, of God to that is what Christ did. What man cannot do to save himself, God provided that through His Son, Jesus Christ. Second is this, that the focus of the gospel message is God and His work of salvation through Jesus Christ. The gospel is not about college kids, Baptist church. The gospel is not about your Sunday school class. The gospel is not how moral we can be. The gospel is God Himself who plans and carries out the redemptive work through His Son, Jesus Christ. And it's a simple thing. And Paul said this in, in Romans chapter 1. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God, the gospel is the power of God, for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, and then for the Gentile. Well, let's just, let me just give you briefly about three or four observations about Paul as the gospel man. Paul was greatly distressed by the things that dis distressed God. In this case, the worship of idols. Let me ask you something. If you're a believer this morning, what is it that distresses you? What is it that infuriates you? Hey, I said the word. But what is it that, that makes you mad? What is it that makes you mad? Is it someone pulling in front of you when you're driving? Is it someone that's not saying hi to you? Is it someone uh, offending you in some way? Or is it, is it the 
thing that offends the very heart of God. When people do not worship the only living God. Second is this. Paul was wise in how he addressed his audiences. We already mentioned that. The contrast between how he addressed them here. He went back to where they were. Started with natural theology that God is the creator of God. Third is Paul's heart was like Hannah the prophet Jeremiah. I, I, I was thinking about this. And I was saying this to Mr. Wall earlier. And I think when they chopped Paul's head. He probably bled Bible and gospel. Because that's how he was. No matter what was going on in his life, he was like the prophet Jeremiah who said, in spite of what was going on in his life, but he said, prophet Jeremiah said, but if I say, I will not mention him, meaning God, or speak anymore in his name. He said, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. And then he says, indeed I cannot. I think that's what Paul was. And then the fourth thing is this. Every event in Paul's life was a platform for the gospel. It didn't matter who he was talking to, it didn't matter what was going on in his life, it didn't matter where he was, who his audience was. It was a platform to speak about the gospel. Let me ask you this, for those of you who are believers this morning. I, I know some of us think that there's kind of like we segment our lives. Okay, Sundays and Wednesdays it's church, if that. But the rest of the time is whatever it is you want to do. But I think God is challenging us through this text and through the life of Paul, that every, it doesn't matter what's happening, good or bad, great things or horrible things in your life, they're all platforms for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you're patted on the back or you're stabbed on the back, it's a platform for the proclamation of the gospel, the living out of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, let me just add this, everything in Number five, everything in Paul's life was viewed through the lens of the gospel. In his letter to the church in Corinth, they told him about all the problems in Corinth. And what does he do? He gathers him up in chapter 15. He says, I want to remind you about the gospel that you received. And then he presents the gospel to them. Galatians who were being seduced by legalism. And he said, guys... He says, if anyone comes to you and preaches a different gospel other than what we, we preach to you, let him be damned forever. He was, his heart just breathed gospel. His heart beat gospel. When he was under house arrest in, in, in Philippi, he wrote this. He said, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. People were trying to make him look bad. He said, they're preaching the gospel out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preached Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they could stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But he said, but what does it matter? The guy was in house arrest, chained to a soldier. And he said, what does it matter that I'm, this, my life is like this, and these guys are kind of preaching the gospel to make me look bad. He said, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, he said, Christ is preached. And because of this, he said, I rejoice. And yes, and I will continue to rejoice. I thought, wow. A man whose heart has been gripped by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel man. He lived and breathed. Proclaim nothing but the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What about you? What makes you man? What grips your heart? Does the gospel grip your heart? Does what Christ has done for you? Does it make you want to sing and praise and just want to serve Him? Search out the scriptures to see what more he has said. And I've said this before, the older I get into faith, the more I understand, the more I realize that the most profound thing in the scriptures and in theology is the most basic. And that's Christ crucified. The older I get, every, everywhere I turn in the scriptures, that's what I find. From Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation. And guys, Paul said this when he was writing to Timothy. He said, 
And he's talking about the grace of our Lord and salvation. And he said, and you know what he said? He said, I am the chief of sinners. He wasn't just putting himself down. There, there's a sense when, when we understand the holiness and the majesty and the beauty and everything that God is, there's a sense that we're horrified by our sins. The reason believers are not horrified by their sins is because we don't see the beauty and the glory and the majesty and the mercy and the love and the greatness of our God is. Because we have not been, we have not been encountered, we have not encountered the God of the Bible because we do not spend time in the Word to know who He is. And as we understand that we who deserve nothing but hell have been given life through Christ. We cannot help like Paul. We shouldn't be able to help like the apostles who said, we cannot help but speak about the things we have seen and we have heard. That's who we are. Guys, I, I want to appeal to you, those of you who are believers. Some of you treat Christianity as like something you do on Sunday mornings. You pay lip service and you might just do it on Wednesdays and you kind of read this. Guys, it is a wedding, it is, it is your vows being committed to the bridegroom to Christ. And when you say, I do, it is a lifelong commitment, a wholehearted commitment to Him. Surrender everything to Him. Those of you who do not know Christ, there is no one greater. There is nothing greater than the life of Christ. And really, the world, the enemy says, you can have life better than your own, what the world offers, and you really can. It's a lie. The greatest fulfillment, the greatest joy, the greatest significance, the greatest delight that you can ever have, the greatest purpose you can have, the meaning in life, you want to be found in Christ. And if you've never trusted Christ, I invite you to do that right now. What Greg and, uh, I mean, uh, Rex, and we're going to be having the Lord's Supper here in a minute. Go ahead and come up here, guys. Get to help here. And we're just going to spend some time with the Lord's Supper. And remind, I want to remind you of what it is that Christ appears to of what Christ has done. If any one of you does not know Christ before we take the Lord's Supper, I want you to come up to us and just visit with us.